Hello, everyone. Can you hear, hear me all right? So, um, my name is Dr. Mike Leahy. I'm the medical oncologist at the Christie Hospital in Manchester. And um, just patients form probably about um, half of my practice, at least, I would say. Um, so, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to come and talk at Just Support UK's meeting. I can see some faces that I recognize around the room. Are you all having a good day today? Yes, Very good. So Judith asked me to talk about a subject. And the, the, the title she gave me was Getting the Best Care. And um, in fact, in the email that subsequently arrived, it, it got a question mark at the end as well. Getting the best care? So that's an interesting question. And, and this is a, I think this is a question like, are you still beating your wife? <laughs> so thanks for that, Judith. <laughs> um, so I haven't prepared a detailed presentation to give you, as you can expect. And I thought we might have a bit of a discussion about this, because it's a very interesting topic. Um, it's quite a challenging topic, isn't it? And this is a bit of a warning shot, I think. I often find as a doctor coming to talk to patient groups that we have to be a little bit careful about some of the things we say because it can get a bit close to the bone, can't it? And I hope that those of you who are here are prepared for that. I mean, I think I'm not going to be today putting up survival curves and things like that, but I know that has been the case in the past, hasn't it? And some people find that a little tricky. So if there are things that um, you don't like about what I'm saying, you can try and shut me up, or you can put your hands over your ears, I guess. Um, so here's a question for you then. Do you, do you think you are getting the best care? Hands up, who thinks they are not getting the best care? One chap, a brave chap putting up here. OK, so there, there are a couple of people who aren't. So that's quite difficult, isn't it? What do people do if they don't think that they're getting the best care? Here's, here's another question. Who thinks they're entitled to the best care? That's interesting. Where, where, where do you think you get that entitlement from? <laughs> taxes. Taxes. <laughs> taxes. Does that give you the right to have the best care? Of course. Does it? Does it? I, I don't know. I mean, the NHS provides a standard of care, and that suggests to me that there is a range of quality. The best, that's quite challenging, isn't it? I think one of the things that you probably are entitled to is that the doctors provide the best care they can give. That, I would agree with. That's a professional standard that we're supposed to meet, an ethical standard standard that we're supposed to meet. But that's not necessarily the same as the best care, is it? Because there might be another doctor who could do better for you. Maybe that's why some of these people put their hands up. So that's quite a tricky question, I think, within the NHS. So um, first thing I'd like to do, if we can, with, this, uh, with the equipment, is to play an audio clip from a podcast. I'm, I'm re researching podcasts at the moment because we're planning to um, broadcast some po podcasts from the Christie Hospital. So I'm looking into what other people have been able to do with their podcasts. So we're going to have, if this doesn't work, I'll just tell you what they said. Um, so this is a podcast, uh, an American podcast, as you can probably. Uh, you will guess, um, which is called Battling and Defeating Cancer. Has anybody heard of this podcast? Okay. Where's my thing? Bear with me here. I've got an oversensitive mouse pad. Clip one. I can't say this. I don't know how many times in our lifetime that I've said this, get a second opinion. Always get a second opinion. I don't care if you've seen this doctor for 25 years. You get a second opinion. And most good doctors will, will know that, that it, it's okay to do that. However, 
with a, di with a disclaimer, absolutely. And in the case of, of something that's life-threatening, I would say mm -hmm. get three opinions. That's and where I was going, yes. <laughs> however, yeah, I, I've been in this for five years now, and I would say that sometimes what people consider to be a second opinion would be to go to the fellow down the hall mm -hmm. who's in practice with the first one. Mm -hmm. And that will probably won't differ so much from what your original doctor said. Right, and I always say go to someplace different, another doctor that doesn't know that. I mean, I even tell them, don't even bring your records. Go in there mm -hmm. cold flat, don't show them mm -hmm. the records. Have them, you know, diagnose you yourself. I mean, even with Scott, we got three opinions on a right. very standard treatment. Absolutely. And uh, it's so important. Go ahead. Yeah, and you can emphasize that, too. It's so important. Well, the next thing I would say is what I know now is that... Uh, I mean, I don't really have to go to doctors anymore at this point, Knockwood, but uh, what I always advise people is if you ever walk in to see a doctor who's going to prescribe a drug with side effects or do surgery on you, you want to read his resume. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, That's what would I find out from that? And I say, it's amazing the things people find out from resumes. You find out a doctor's training, his, his areas of interest, his qualifications, his experience. But, but you find out the most amazing things if you'll just read the CV, read the resume. If he's published any papers, you can read a few of those and find out what his approach is. And uh, in your book, uh, Fight Your Health Insurer and Win, uh, you have a chapter called Commanding Officer, Qualify Your Doctor. Well, yes, people think it's really mysterious. Like, you know, John was mentioning you need to find the best doctor. And I think it's of critical importance if what you need to cure or treat your cancer is a surgery, particularly if it's a really complicated, complex surgery, you need to know how do you find the best? How do you know what best means? And people think it's pretty mysterious, but for me, it's not. For me, if I'm undergoing a huge surgery, you know, I don't care if anybody likes that doctor, I don't care what kind of reputation he has. I don't care if he's a fire-breathing dragon. What I want to know is that I, I, he's most likely to get me a good outcome. Right. For me, surgery or treatment is all about outcomes. How many so I'm looking for the doctor who has had the most uh, documented good outcome. Yeah. So when it comes to surgery, usually I think people ask the first question, which is, how many of these have you done? But they often don't ask the second question, which is more important, which would how be how folks are they, do it. how are they exactly, how are they doing? You know, it's a very friendly question. It's not like, what are your outcomes? It's just how are they doing? It's a magic question because doctors are never asked that question. And it's an open-ended question. They say the most amazing things because people report this to me. You'll find out the truth about the outcomes if you ask that question. And if you want to be more scientific in nature, and he's published articles, hopefully he's published his outcomes, statistics, graphs, and charts. You can go, you can go read them. Yeah. And it's amazing because if people are going to have their house painted, they'll get two or three different estimates. They'll check them out. They may mm -hmm. go to the Better Business Bureau. But when they're dealing with something as uh, uh, life-threatening and important as uh, cancer, uh, a lot of people wind up at the surgeon or at the oncologist or a radiologist where they just happen to be sent because uh, uh, another doctor referred them there or they're in their plan. Mm -hmm. And there's a right. big difference in terms of not only quality of doctors, experience of doctors, but also philosophy of doctors. There's, you know, some, uh, there's a scientific component, but there's also a little bit of art to the uh, mm -hmm. practice of medicine. And, and sometimes you need a doctor that uh, has the strategy or the uh, either a conservative or a little bit of a risk-taking spirit that the matches mm -hmm. the patient. Absolutely. So that's a, that's a viewpoint, isn't it? Get a second opinion, get a third opinion. So what I thought maybe we'd do now is just allow you to have a brief discussion among yourselves. You're broken up into the, the tables. Just talk among yourselves about whether any of you have done that and how that was for you. And if you haven't done it, why haven't you done it? Did you not think it was a good idea? So I'm going to give you five or ten minutes just to discuss this among yourselves, and then we'll maybe hear back from people who have taken a second opinion or who have not. 
So five minutes at least. Okay, so have you had enough time to discuss your own views about this? Let's come to this table over here. What, 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 what's been your decision? Who's going to be the spokesperson for the table? What do you think about having second opinions? We, we've, we asked for one at the Royal Marsden, but got no. They wouldn't see you? No. That's very odd, isn't it? That's interesting. Has anybody else who put up your hand been refused a second opinion? Oh, you've had bad luck there, I think, because that's, uh, that's an unusual experience. Anybody else on this table have any other views about going for second or third opinions? Think it's a good idea? Trust. Mm. So second opinions is something about a failure of trust. So you wouldn't go for a second, that's what I'm saying, you wouldn't go for a second opinion unless you didn't trust them. Well, we trust ours, but it's just the side effects don't seem to be acknowledged. Mm. So we need some trust. So if you ask for a second opinion, you're inferring this, you're inferring, we were asking for a second opinion, that the first opinion, you don't really believe it. So I want a second one, which past casts doubts on the mm, integrity of the person who gave the opinion first. So would that destroy your relationship with the, you have with your consultant? Exactly. Yes. What about this table over here? Who's got something to say? You've got... Depends on the quality of your first assessment. My first surgeon, uh, presented with this scan, wanted me to sit and wait and see what happened. Well, I wasn't going to do that, so I asked for a second opinion. The second uh, surgeon said he'd seen one of these once before, and he was right. So I would not have wanted to sit and wait and see what happened. <laughs> Mine is, a, is one of puzzlement, because uh, maybe Dr. Lincoln can help. Given that we've had just treatable for about 10 years or so, have we got a long enough um, sort of longitudinal studies to, to work out whether someone can be cured of GIST? Um, well, that's a very specific question. Um, and the answer, I think, straightforwardly, is no. We don't have yet the data. There's, um, the initial suggestion was that that was not possible with the existing tools that we had our, at our disposal. Mm -hmm. And perhaps long-term follow-up is showing us that there may be some people who are pushed into something which is very, looks very much like cure because there's no activity after a very long period of time. So it will require more research to be able to answer that question definitely. Well, therefore, if you've been discharged as I have, would it be efficient? Sorry, if you have been discharged, as I have after 10 years, and that was um, uh, surgery for metast metastatic cancer, a metastatic tumor, but no further uh, treatment thereafter other than scans, would it be efficient in terms of the NHS's resources to say, well, okay, we'll give you a, a, an ultrasound scan on your liver or something like that just to keep you... It was not going to cost a fortune, but would that be a prudent and efficient um, way of dealing with someone who feels, I'm out of this, I'm now without service? Um, well, um, we, I think we're getting slightly off the track about having second opinions, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, yes, it, 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 I suppose it does pertain to it. And those kind of questions, I don't think we have the answer to, is, the, is, is I'm afraid, the, the honest answer. Mm -hmm. Efficient use. I don't know really what that means, really, in that sense. Um, in a very rare condition, you might think it's not going to be noticeable in the NHS budget. The problem with that argument is there are actually more rare conditions than there are common ones. 
So if everybody applies that to their rare condition, then it's a, it's a problem for the, for the budget. So I, I don't know whether doing ultrasound scans in an asymptomatic patient 10 years after surgery is an efficient use of resource. Yeah. Going to this table about second opinions. Anybody want to contribute? I think the key word here, in terms of the question you're asking, is opinion, second opinion. Some of us on this table are inoperable, and whether a gist tumour is inoperable is a matter of opinion. And a different doctor looking at um, the information that they have about you, but with a different range of experience and knowledge of, of GIST patients might come to a different conclusion. And I don't think it's in any way questioning the ability of the first doctor to say, I would like another doctor with a different range of knowledge and experience to look at my case to see whether or not they come to the same conclusion. It's opinion. Anybody over here want to? have the microphone. <laughs> what do you think about second opinions? Anybody here been for a second opinion? We've all been for the pause GIST clinic. Uh, the pause GIST clinic. The ultimate second opinion. <laughs> so you're quite pleased with your experience having a second opinion? Well, I was pleased with the first opinion from Professor Wall that we'd had anyway, so I thought we were quite lucky. But we were even luckier to get um, Professor Judson and Dr. Beluso as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And over here, anybody want to add anything to the conversation about getting a second opinion? Okay. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll just continue with the, uh, this American lady, who, by the way, does not have a gist. When I first saw the oncologist in Northampton, it's a doctor called Dr. Patel, and it was my first appointment, and I was very frightened, and she had all my notes there. She had all the research that she could get her hands on for GIST, and she said, I don't know enough about this. I want you to see an expert. Let's look at the list of all the people in Britain, and you choose who you go to. And I ended up with Penella Wall, and I've been absolutely delighted with the care I've had. But I would go back to that oncologist any time for anything, because I trust her, because she says, if I don't know enough, I will refer you on. And I thought, how lucky was I? Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Well, my second choice was you, but based on the question you've given to us, you won't mind if I have a third opinion now, would you? <laughs> Three years on, is that, you quite accept that, it's not a problem. You haven't said anything yet. <laughs> You'll get a chance in a minute. We'll, we'll play the second clip. Two, yeah. Well, yes, and uh, that brings me to how I, how I found him. Can I stop that? And the first thing... And in your case, it seems like the magic words were sugar baker. Well, yes, and uh, that brings me to how I, how I found him. And the first thing I did was I went uh, to the NCI database of a medical journal article. And I just typed in the name of my disease. It's called, it was called Pseudomyxoma peritonei. It's a less aggressive form of appendix cancer. I just typed that in. And a, I'm amazed a couple you of, could even spell it. Hmm? I'm amazed you could even spell it. <laughs> well, I was a French teacher in my first career, so I'm sort of a word fancier. Oui. <laughs> so anyway, I went, I went into the whole huge database of medical journal articles on the National Cancer Institute, and I pulled up thousands of articles. And I skimmed through the titles. I was looking for um, numbers like study of 385 appendix cancer patients, study of 472 appendix cancer patients, because I figured the places that reported on the greatest number of patients were probably the centers for this. And the surgeon that had the most articles on there was probably going to be one of the leading lights in the field. 
So lo and behold, the only ones who had studied anywhere over 100 patients and on up to four or 500 was Dr. Sugarbaker. And then I pulled up his name and how many articles did he have and what were they about? So he had, at that time, 800 peer-reviewed medical journal articles and studies, and probably 700 of them were about appendix cancer, all different aspects of it. So that was obvious. Then I went to an online patient support group, and they had a list of doctors on there that people had been to. They had compiled a list of 20 surgeons. And what most people do with a list like that is they'll ask, who do you like? Or was your surgeon really nice? But what I did was I took all 20 names and I wrote a, an engaging letter about my crazy story, my four diagnoses and my three prognoses. And I said, is there any treatment? Can you help me? And I sent it to all 20. And 16 of them called me. I was sitting surrounded by studies and Kleenex boxes and everything else in my pajamas. And within three days, surgeons started to call me on the phone. Sixteen of them called me personally, and they taught me all about appendix cancer. And every single one of those 16 mentioned Dr. Sugarbaker. Either we do it like Dr. Sugarbaker, we learned it from Dr. Sugarbaker, we differ from Dr. Sugarbaker. So he pioneered these techniques and this intraperitoneal chemotherapy that goes with it 31 years ago. So after all that, I mean, would there be any question about where I would go? It's easy. Like sugar baker. Easy as pie. And, and two, when John talked about going from Philadelphia to Chicago, I had to chuckle because I had to borrow frequent flyer miles to fly from Seattle to Washington, D.C. for my consultation. Wow. But so, life and you were going to travel where you had to travel. Well, that's another thing about choosing the best doctor. People often have what I call a geographical objection. Like, isn't there someone like Dr. Sugarbaker in Chicago? And it's like, no. But I have to, you know, I, I couldn't, you know, I have to stay near home. And in some few cases, I, I really have compassion for that because you want your family close by, et cetera. But for me, you know, I'm kind of a pioneer, and I thought, you know, I'd rather fly to Washington, D.C. and live and have a good shot at it than to stay in Seattle and die. I would have gone to. I would have. I would have caught an icebreaker for the South Pole if that's where he was. <laughs> there you go. So she wasn't satisfied with the second opinion or a third opinion. She went for twenty opinions, and then took another. It wasn't any of those twenty opinions she went to. She went for the best, and that's how she decided how to get the best care. And she was prepared to take an eight-hour flight every week in order to attend her follow-up appointments after her surgery to get the best care. So there you have it. <laughs> Hands up, who would adopt the same strategy? So quite an American strategy, isn't it? Quite a few of you would. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about that in a minute, but um, we're going to move on to a different topic now. Asha King. That's an interesting subject, isn't it? How many of you have been following the Asher King case? Hands up. Okay, we're going to do another straw poll here because I think this is a very interesting case. Um, and it seems to have polarized the whole country, those who are for and those who are against what's happened. And I think that this is a bit of a division between the hearts and the heads. And those two often never really seem to agree. So hands up in the room if you think Asher King's parents were right in what they did. And hands up in the room if you think that they were wrong. So you're all hearts, aren't you? But, well, it's a very difficult thing, isn't it? Asher King's parents decided that they knew better than the doctors about what to do for their child. And clearly, as their parents, they had every right to take an emotional decision. But in terms of the medical decision that they took, there's quite a lot of evidence that they weren't making a good decision for that child, maybe even a bad decision. So 
this comes down to the same point, isn't it? And it's what, what somebody was saying earlier about trusting your doctor. Clearly what happened with Asha King is there was a breakdown in trust between the parents and the doctors in that hospital. And they decided that they had to be the ones to make the decision about what was the better medical care, the best care. And they've, they've taken a, a different route. So is that something that all, we, we all, you all want to do? Sit down with the um, NCI PubMed database, go through thousands of articles, make your decisions about what is the best care. In other words, take your own decisions into your own hands and then find the best doctor wherever they are in the world or the country and go to them. Hands up who thinks that's the way to get best care. So there doesn't seem to be that much support for that idea. So I'm just going to give you five or ten minutes to talk among yourselves in the tables again. Is, is that the route to getting the best care? Because that appears to be what these, this American lady is suggesting. Okay, well, let's, let's see if there's any feedback. So from this table, are there any, any issues about the way that this um, approach to finding the best care through self-research, which is what she obviously did, does anybody have any issues with that at all? Well, unless... I think the problem is that unless you are a doctor, you don't really know um, if um, what the, the information you're being given by someone who might offer you a way out, such as in this case of this boy, is, um, is really feasible or not. You just have to trust in the end of the day and weigh up what you're, the information you're being given. And that is an extremely difficult thing, whether you're taking that decision for yourself or, and even more importantly, for taking it on behalf of your child. And uh, I don't know if I, if I think that if someone did offer me hope that they could keep my child alive while others said they couldn't, then and ultimately I'd probably have to go for that, even though there was a risk. Uh, okay, I mean, that wasn't in any sense what happened to Asher King. There weren't offers of no treatment or a cure at all, no. So, no, no, never mind. But the issue about can we assess our own on our own can you, as, as lay people, assess on your own the evidence for where is the best care and go to it? Anybody on this table? There's two, two sorts of questions. If the thing that is surgery, then that's different from if it's an oncologist, because a surgeon is a, I mean, forgive me, a very skilled person, and so that if you want lumps out, then you'd go to the best person who could get the lumps out. Whereas oncology is a much more diffuse thing, isn't it? If you know what the drugs are, and if the person's up to date, it really doesn't matter where they are. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> don't, you, don't hit me when you get it. No, I don't agree with that, David. <laughs> Surprisingly. Surgeons are very good at doing operations. That's very true. But I don't think necessarily that, the, that means that they have different level of expertise, it's just a different application. It's something that's easier to go a long way for. So, for, for a one, that, that's, that's very true. Anybody on this table want to reflect on the lady that we heard about going to Sugar Baker after taking 20 different second opinions? Um, in terms of gist, um, when Eve was diagnosed, um, obviously, we went to and got second opinions in this country to everyone we were told um, had the most experience. But we were also advised there was a specialist clinic in America. So um, because her stomach was the thing that was at stake at that point, we decided we would go to America. And their, their perspective was quite different. So once we'd been there, we did feel we had the best available opinion, and it was able to kind of um, guide us on what we then 
decided would happen when we were back here. So we, were, we weren't planning on going to America again, but having made those connections, we could then make the best decision armed with the best available information at the time. But that also prompted um, the desire to set up a similar facility in this country. Um, so yeah, we, we went elsewhere to try and get the best there was possible and having determined that, it, it's steered what's happened since. Um, in, in the case of that um, young boy in the proton therapy, I have a question really. Did, was, were they able to access that treatment here for their child? Well, I, um, the, the facts of the, the Asher King case are, are quite complicated. The, the answer is that the doctors in Southampton did not think that the proton therapy added any benefit. If there had been benefit, then yes, Asher could have been sent for it. Asher actually had a very treatable condition with very good prognosis. Um, if he'd continued with the um, treatment that they'd, provide, they'd advised at Southampton, and there didn't seem to be any benefit in doing proton beam therapy. That was the, the nature of the discussion, which the parents didn't accept. They thought the proton beam, they thought they were able to make this decision themselves to weigh up what they thought was a better treatment and take a different opinion from their doctors and then um, act on that. And that's really the thing that I'm talking about here. Can the patient make those decisions themselves? So if you were in the position to go through the databases and read the papers, which you all are because these are public databases, um, is, do you see a problem with that? Or is that something you feel that you would be able to do? What about this table? To, to weigh up, the, to, to weigh up the, the evidence and make the decision, you're the only person who can do that. Nobody else can make that decision for you. To make the decision or to weigh it up, the pros and cons? Um, other people can weigh it up, yes. Mm. Um, your opinion. Okay. Uh, just a simplistic point. If a, a life-saving drug is not available on the NHS for cost reasons through NICE, yeah but it is available elsewhere, would that not be a reason to send your child to another country to obtain that drug? Yes, if you had the money, absolutely. And, and but you're then making that decision. Yes, but presumably because somebody would... Your consultant's guidance, your consultant's guidance is to stay in this country and have treatment. Well, that's a very interesting question, and I'm not sure that that's necessarily correct. I think that the the professional obligation on doctors is to tell you about the treatment options. Um, and if there was a life-saving drug that you could not get on the NHS but could buy privately, then I think the doctor is under an obligation to tell you that. So the, the, the question, I suppose, is do you trust the doctor to do that? So we come back to this thing somebody over here was saying about trust. And it was over here, wasn't it? I can't remember how second opinions really reflect an issue of trust. So does anybody else on this table want to contribute any more about this self-researched search for the best care? Anybody have a view about that? Hello. You know I challenged my... You asked me to have a resection, a resection, and I didn't want one. I didn't think my body could take it. And I did mither and mither and mither you and asked for an ablation, and in the end... You found me an ablation and it was the right decision for me, but you supported me while I waited for that to happen. So I did challenge you and you obviously weighed up what I wanted and uh, found it for me. So um, I rest my case on that one. <laughs> Thank you. I do think it's very important to keep yourself as informed as you possibly can so that you understand your illness as far as you possibly can and that you have someone trustworthy to whom you can go and ask for advice about how you should go forward. I think that's the So coming back to that trust. Hmm. Well, I'm going to have to rush back to my clinic in a few minutes, but... Um, so I've just tried to wrap up some of this, and I'm, I'm afraid there isn't an, an easy answer to this question. There is no way to be sure that you can get the best care, I'm afraid. 
Um, and there are a number of problems with all of these approaches that have been suggested. Um, in some situations, it may benefit to do what this lady has done. In others, and I'm afraid I would say in Asha King's case, not. Um, so it doesn't, it's, there isn't a black and white thing. And I, I just want to challenge some of the premises of this. First of all, the cult of the doctor. There is a rather simplistic view that doctors are all-knowing beings from different planets who have special understanding and the ability to cure. And I'm afraid that isn't true. And this lady who went to see Sugar Baker, who is now 76, if he'd actually done that operation on her, I hate to think what that meant. I hope it was his team who operated. It's not a doctor, it's a team. You know, and, and all of us who are, whose names are associated with particular services, we all are simply one member of a team. And those other people are as important as the person whose name is on the clinic. So, and, and that gives you an idea that, you know, there, there isn't, isn't, there's no guru there. There is a service which is, has benefits and weaknesses compared to other teams. Yes, there may be some special knowledge, but there may be disadvantages as well. So the cult of the doctor, I would challenge, going to find the sugar baker. And, and it's just not realistic, is it? Because if everybody with GIST goes to see Professor Judson, you'd have a long waiting clinic, you know, there are a lot of people with GIST. Yes, we can do it for the pause GIST patient because we think that they are so rare we can have a single clinic in the country. And that's a really great model of networking. And it's I, I, I don't know how many people have found the GIST clinic themselves through research and how many of them have found it through networking and support through, we're gonna come on to the role of a patient group like this or from their own doctors. So for very, very rare situations, and in fact, appendix cancer and pseudomyxome peritone is one of those where there are in fact two centers in the UK where patients are sent for intraperitoneal chemotherapy. One of them is in Basingstoke. We have a patient here from Basingstoke. And the other one is at the Christie Hospital. But there is a network to refer those patients with a very rare condition for an extremely rare pr process. But for most other you know, common conditions, breast cancer, everybody can't go to see the best breast cancer doctor in the world or in the country. So there's just, that doesn't really work. The, the second thing I want to challenge, the premise, is the, the secret cure. You know, that if you have a condition that somewhere out there there is a secret cure, that if only you can do the research, you'll find it. That isn't necessarily the case either. And as, as a doctor with some understanding of biology and pharmacology, you know, I think I'm aware of the extraordinary effects that some drugs suddenly do produce. But in the majority of cases of chronic conditions like this, secret cures probably don't exist. And if they do, we know about them really fast. I mean, those of you who have been on Gleevec maybe are probably aware how fast that came into clinical practice when it became clear that it was effective. With, within months, really, of the first patient who had that drug, it was being delivered in clinical practice around the world, particularly, well, in those areas of the world that could um, afford it. Um, but, there, but out there, there are hundreds and hundreds of people saying that there is a secret cure. And I'm sure that if you do your own internet research, you will find these things, um, whether it is intravenous vitamin C or colonic irrigation or whatever it is, there are lots of people saying that they have the cure for cancer. Um, and this is a, a bit of a holy grail that unfortunately it's very difficult to avoid the temptation to go and seek. And I'm not saying that maybe going questing for the holy grail is not a, you know, it's a, it's a way of life, isn't it? And it, it, is a, it is perhaps a coping strategy, but it's very rarely found. Unfortunately, sometimes it is found, so we can never say never. That's why it's not easy, this. So um, I think it is really difficult to define what is best and how to get it. This lady who read these papers, she apparently had the ability to 
judge scientific methodology in the clinical papers and say, this paper, it was worthwhile, this one doesn't show anything that I'm interested in. But actually, that's quite a difficult skill, um, which only, you know, um, biomed biomedical people get through training. It's not straightforward at all. Um, and I think there is perhaps um, another approach to this, which is that you can be your own best carer. And this is not something that you have to go and seek on the internet. And the value of your own actions in your own health are, I think, the big untouched resource in healthcare. And that's one of the things that we're wanting to look at at the Christie Hospital. Now, to a certain extent, that means being informed. And I think as much as you can, being informed about your condition is really important, and being savvy, and networking through groups like this, but working in a trusting relationship with your doctor. Hopefully, your doctor is a professional who will have at, you, at heart your best care and will help you, like this lady's um, doctor in Northampton, to find that best care. Now, that is a different approach. That's not what this lady um, did with her quest for sugar baker, it's a different approach. It's using your own doctors to find the best care. And I think that is their role. I think that is their duty. And they ought to do that. But if they say at the end of the day, well, I don't think you would have be benefited from uh, a second opinion, then you have to then make that decision yourself. Am I going to trust them or am I not? And then this comes down to this trust issue. And the trust issue in the UK and America is very interesting, isn't it? Because in a private health center, there is the sneaking suspicion that the doctor is offering you a treatment because he's going to get paid for it. Whereas in a public health centre, there is the sneaking suspicion that the doctor is not offering you the treatment because he's worried about the budget. So both sides of the private and public health care system, there is not perfect trust. And I think that's obviously um, a, a big issue. So if you, if you don't have trust in your doctors, then that is a, is a, is a, is a problem. So, um, I, the answer is, um, I've got my, I don't know, a, slide, a, slide, a title slider. If, you're, if you don't feel that you're getting the best care, then I guess probably you're not. But I think, first of all, there are, there are a lot of things that you can do for yourself, whether that involves trawling PubMed for thousands of um, reports and trying to make the assessments yourself, or working within groups like this to find um, resources that might be interesting and working with a trusting relationship with your doctor, sometimes second opinions being sent for care somewhere else can be helpful. But I think also th there is a lot that you can do for yourself in terms of um, ensuring that you are as healthy as you can be. So self-care is important, exercise, diet, weight control, lifestyle modifications, all of those things. Those are not um, elusive and um, fake outcome measures, that, uh, outcome changing measures. Those are absolutely real things which many people don't fully take advantage of. So thank you very much. That, that, that phone call was my taxi outside. So I can now oh. get out of here without being mobbed. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much. Mike.